Hi everyone, welcome to this evening's webinar on the Auschwitz album. My name is Orly Barnett and I'm the Education Director at the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center. On behalf of myself and the staff at the Holocaust Center, we thank you for joining us tonight from near and far and it's wonderful to see where everyone is logging in from. Please continue to share in the chat where you are joining us from. I'm honored to introduce our speaker tonight, Liz Elsby, and I'd like to share a little bit about her. Liz has worked at Yad Vashem since 2006 as a museum tour guide, Holocaust educator, lecturer and content writer, as well as guiding educational groups across Europe, Poland, Prague, Theresien and Berlin. Liz is a facilitator at Yad Vashem's Echoes and Reflections program. For those of you who are familiar with it, you will know that it is a platform that helps to educate teachers um, and gives them methodologies on how to teach the Holocaust effectively to their students in America. Liz has participated in many of these webinars uh, with the uh, Cape, Town Holocaust and, Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center, Durban and uh, Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Centers, and we're so excited to have her back. Liz has a particular interest in art created during the Holocaust with an emphasis on the Nazi ghetto or camp of Theresien. She herself is a graduate of the B'Tselel Academy of Art in Israel and art and design and is a working illustrator and graphic designer herself. She often incorporates Holocaust themes into her own artwork. To tell you a little bit about the lecture tonight, this is an event that is part of the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center's public programming, accompanying an international traveling exhibition, which we currently have up at the center entitled Seeing Auschwitz. One of the main components of this exhibition, Seeing Auschwitz, is the inclusion of images taken from the now famous so-called Auschwitz album or Lily Jacob album. With Liz as our guide this evening, we will be examining more closely these very photographs in tonight's presentation. The photographs from the Auschwitz album or Lily Jacob album were originally taken by Nazi perpetrators to document their so-called processing of new arrivals to Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp, in this case, Hungarian Jews, and to select them for either forced labor or for the majority of the arrivals, immediate death. So both Liz and the exhibition, Seeing Auschwitz, ask us of, as viewers the same thing, to examine in detail each image and ask searching questions about what we think we know about the photographs as well as what each image really reveals. The Nazi photographs show a lack of regard for the human being standing in front of their lens. And thus we as the viewers have a responsibility and we're encouraged to go beyond the gaze of the perpetrators, to look more closely at the individuals depicted and to attempt to restore the humanity that was taken away from them. And with that, I'd like to hand over to our esteemed guest tonight, Liz Elsby. Liz, over to you. Thank you so much, Rally. What a beautiful way of um, describing it. Okay, everyone, let me get my PowerPoint up, which is uh, usually the moment my 18 year old has to come in and help me, but I think, um, it's doing it okay today. Is it full screen? Yes. All right, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for coming. And I'm so happy to see um, so many familiar faces and um, faces I don't know. And today we're gonna talk about the Auschwitz album. And for years in my job at Yad Vashem, working um, in the content department, I would see this album and the photographs over and over again, and I would spend hours looking closely at the pictures, thinking about the people in those photographs. Who were they? What were they thinking at this particular terrible point in their life when most of them would not survive? However, the information we had about the album was very sketchy, and I'll give you some more details about that in a minute. And I remember with my dear colleague, Cheryl Ochayon, about 12 years ago, we started looking at the pictures and we said, this can't just be one transport. There's different shadows, there's different angles. Um, the, the positioning of the people vary from photo to photo. And together we're going to see how that is actually the case. So I'm gonna begin with this quote by Barbie Zelizer um, from her book, Remember to Forget, about the importance of photographs. And photographs seem utterly real. They come, we imagine, directly to us, and they are the most effortless food for the mind conceivable. 
However, photographs are not subjective and photographs depend very heavily on who is taking the pictures, why they're taking the pictures, for what end, and how they use the camera to achieve that end. And do this, I'm gonna give you a little photograph we're gonna look at together. And we talk about how the importance of context and understanding the story behind the photographs, which is why the exhibits you currently have in South Africa is so important because it tells you the story of Auschwitz and what happened there and the history. So that when you see these albums, the album, you understand the photographs that you're seeing, but just take it on face value. What do we see in this picture? And as we look at it together, we see people who are sitting in the grass with their children, people who are smiling, people who are looking at the camera, people who don't feel seem afraid, people who don't seem to be um, um, under any duress. But when we carefully look at the picture, we begin to see a few signs, a few symbols that already warn us that this is not a normal gathering and these people are not in a normal situation. And we can already see that when we look closely, when we look at the stars. This photograph is actually one of the photographs from the Auschwitz album filmed as these poor people who have been selected to die are waiting their turn to go into the gas chambers. So from this picture without context, we don't understand what we're seeing. This picture from the same album, and I'll go into all of this very much in detail in a minute, already gives us a framework we see people dressed in uniforms, Nazi uniforms. We see a train, we see the infamous tower, which has become an icon of the Holocaust. And I think many people in the world recognize this tower as the tower from Birkenau, the death camp of Auschwitz. We see railway lines, we see barracks, we have some kind of framework for understanding these photographs. And the question that remains, and these photographs, by the way, you can see in, in the book, The Auschwitz Album, which we have at Yad Vashem. You can also buy it online. The actual album is in Yad Vashem. I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but we also have every single photograph online on the Yad Vashem website. And I encourage you after this talk to go into that website and really look at the pictures carefully. Um, so I'll give you a little background to the photographs and then we're gonna jump right in. The photographs were, um, were found by Lily Jacob who came from the town of Bilki, Hungary. She was sent to Auschwitz in 19, Birkenau in 1944. Um, she was later transferred to um, a camp in Germany to Nordhausen, a subcamp of Nordhausen. And it's there when the camp is liberated in a very sick, depleted condition. She's put into the barracks of the former SS guards, one of the only clean and decent places in the camp to house these very sick people. And she finds this album wrapped up in a pajama or a piece of clothing in the drawer of one of the former SS men. And when she opens it up, she's shocked to see that the album contains not only pictures of herself and her family members, but the people from her community um, of Bilki, Hungary. And what she finds, this incredible coincidence, is the only known photographic evidence that we have of what happened to arrivals of Jews to Birkenau. And she gives the album to Yad Vashem in 1980, and, and there it has resided ever since. Um, and for most people, every time you see a movie about the Holocaust, every book you've ever read, this album is used as an illustration. Often incorrectly, you'll see photographs from 1944 from this particular transport used to, um, to illustrate an event that might've happened in 1942. Um, but it's become really iconic of these photographs have become the symbol of the Holocaust. But, the purpose of the album is unclear, apparently, says the Yad Vashem website. And it says it was not intended for propaganda purposes, nor does it have any obvious personal use. One assumes that it was prepared as an official reference for higher authority as were photo albums from other concentration camps. The United States Holocaust Museum says, we don't know why the album that Lily Jacob discovered was created. And thanks to incredible scholarship, by, by three predominant Holocaust scholars, and I'll show you another young um, historian also doing work in this album, we now know that's not true. 
We now know exactly why the album was taken. It's not a mystery. And for me, it's always interesting that when it comes to the visual, when it comes to photographs, it takes almost 60 years more because it's only in the early 2000s, the mid 2000s, um, even beyond the 2000 pluses, 10s, that these historians really spend about three years looking into the history of the album. So for decades, nobody knew why the album was taken. And often you'll hear very experienced guides and very experienced educators, again, say, we don't know why the album was taken. So there's questions we ask, why was the album made and for whom? When were the pictures taken? How do you ascertain exactly when these photographs were taken? When, how many transports are represented in the album and how do we know where they were from and how exactly did the whole selection process in, Aus in Birkenau happen? And I just wanna show you the power of very, very fundamental research and looking carefully at photographs and backing how you look and how you use your eyes uh, with historical data, with historical documentation, how we could build a new picture of the Auschwitz album and really understand why it was taken. So what happened upon arrival in Auschwitz, Auschwitz-Birkenau? And these three, the four historians whose work was for me is incredible are Tal Brutman, Christoph Kreutzmuller, please forgive my terrible pronunciation, Stefan Hordler and Ulrike Koperman, who have really dedicated themselves to, to going into the nitty gritty of why this album was taken, um, looking at every photograph, looking at the history behind it, and opening up our eyes. So the album itself, um, as you can see here, the outside, is not actually called the Auschwitz album. It has a night title, and the title is The Resettlement of the Jews from Hungary. That's the title of the album. Um, and um, Christoph um, Kroetzmann and Stefan Hollis say this, um, and Tal Brutman in their, 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 you know, their groundbreaking article about this, their research, they say, some photographs of the album have become the primary representation of the workings of the final solution at Auschwitz and beyond. Across the world, in museums, documentaries, and publications, they are now embodiments of the Holocaust. They have become iconic despite the fact that they were taken to demonstrate the quality of the work being done by the SS during the Hungarian operation. They do not show the reality of how transports were processed when they arrived at Auschwitz, but a reality when staged by the SS for internal propaganda purposes. To put it into colloquial terms, this album was made to suck up to the bosses in Berlin. They wanted to show off. And we're gonna examine that together. So here's a little bit about this operation, which we actually call Operation Huss. And in May, 1944, almost 300,000 Jews came to Auschwitz in just 15 days, of whom 215,000 were from Hungary, all due to Rudolf Huss, who was the commandant of Auschwitz. He comes back after a hiatus, comes back to Auschwitz to facilitate the mass murder of the Jews of Hungary. And the album shows and emphasizes the work of Huss and the operation in his name. And that operation is called Operation Huss. That was the, the deportation of the Jews of Hungary to Auschwitz. And this is a career making move for him. He could show off to the big boys in Berlin, you gave me this big mission to get rid of these people in an effective manner. And I'm gonna show you how we do it. To that end, the album deals with three different subjects. It wants to deal with the deportations themselves, the arrival, um, the mechanics of how they arrive. It wants to show how quickly and effectively you can take people from these trains and turn them into either prisoners, which is the small minority, or take the majority of the useless people and send them off to be murdered. And it also wants to show how effectively they can deal with all of their belongings, these belongings that are gonna be sent back to Germany to be used by the German public. So here's what we know. It's not just one album. There were 15 copies of the album made for Albert Speer, the good Nazi, Oswald Pohl, Hans Kandler, and Richard Glucks, among the other high-ranking officials. This is the only known surviving copy. 
And we believe this copy was in the hands of, of um, one of the photographers, Walter. There were three photographers and many people are quite shocked to know that we believe that some of the photographs were actually taken by Rudolf Haas himself. So we know that three SS photographers are working, Walter and Hoffman who are working in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, testimony was given about them by a Polish photographer called William Brass, who was forced to develop these photographs once they were taken. And he's an amazing resource. And the subject of the album is not the SS or the killing or the camp. What they want to show is the flow. They want to show the efficiency. They want to show off. The album subject was not the killing itself, but the way it was carried out. The successive stages which a continuous, unprecedented flow of people was managed during the process of destruction as sewn to dozens of mostly identical images. They're not going to show the guys in Berlin bodies. These are the men who come up with those ideas. These are the... the architects of the final solution. They don't need to see the bodies. They don't need to see what Auschwitz the camp looks like. They're not interested in seeing Birkenau. What they're interested in seeing, how quickly can you do it? How effectively? And that's what the album is going to deliver. When you understand that, all the pictures make sense. Now, one of the things we now know is the pictures were not taken in sequence because there's about four arrivals, different trains coming on different dates. There are also pictures here that are not connected, that are stuck into the album. And the creators of this album wanted to make kind of a cohesive story. They have all these different pictures from different days. We can imagine these men sitting over a big light table and maneuvering these pictures around to show a narrative that is going to have five subjects and be kind of categorized into 11 sub, five subjects with subcategories, making 11 different titles, 11 different chapters, if you will, in this story. To that end, we can see, and this is what the historians have mapped out for us, all the photographs take with the red um, rim around them were taken on a certain day. The ones with the green are taken on a certain day. The ones with the yellow are taken on a certain day. Blue. And we can see how they are blended together to make this cohesive story about the arrival of these um, transports from Hungary. So they're divided into five chapters, the arrival, the sorting, men upon arrival, women upon arrival. These are the subchapters too. After the sorting, men still fit for labor, women still fit for labor, men no longer fit for labor, women and children no longer fit for labor. In other words, people on their way to the gas chambers. For me, some and probably for all my colleagues who deal with this subject, some of the most difficult pictures ever taken innocent people walking to the gas chambers. After delousing, in other words, the very few have been selected for work in the camp, what does that mean to delouse them and how their belongings are dealt with? Let's jump in. First of all, a little history for those of you who may not have been to um, Auschwitz-Birkenau and those who have not had the opportunity yet to see the show in the museum. Um, Birkenau, is the um, second large camp, as you can see here, it's the gate of Birkenau when it was liberated by the uh, Soviet army in January 27th, 1945 is when it's liberated. Um, Birkenau is one of three main huge big camps and there's almost 40 sub camps that are also part of the, stat the satellites of the Auschwitz-Birkenau um, 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 camp. So we see here Auschwitz I, the Stammlager, this is the little camp over here, which is a concentration camp. After 1942, um, most of the prisoners there were Polish prisoners, Russian prisoners of war. And Auschwitz-Birkenau is created in early 1942. Um, over here, we can see late 41, 42, 42. And Manowitz, um, Buna Manowitz, the, um, the, the little camp that's attached to all of the war industries of IG Farben, you can kind of get this about a kilometer and a half from Auschwitz I to Birkenau. We see train tracks. And one of the reasons that Auschwitz is selected as a place to, to, you know, to create this, um, this, this center of mass murder is this was always a main railway junction um, for trains going from the Russian Empire to what was Germany um, before the uh, World War I. 
um, very big railway junction trains going all over Poland, Russian Empire, through Germany to Europe, to, um, uh, Czechoslovakia, et cetera. So a lot of railway, a lot of infrastructure. It's also known for having a lot of raw um, uh, materials, a lot of water, a lot of coke, which is a type of very concentrated coal, uh, uh, a lot of uh, free labor in the form of prisoners and far away from the lines, from the uh, battle lines. Um, so we can see in the summer of 1944, these are aerial photographs taken by the, the Air Force, actually the South African um, Air Force flying with the RAF, South African pilots flying with the RAF in 1944. And we can see um, very clearly how massive the camp is. This is the part of the camp that was never completed, that in the camp jargon is called Mexico. Here is that infamous gate. We can see here, it looks tiny. Uh, when you're there, it's very, very small. And it looms up in photographs, you see how small it is. This ramp, this um, tra train line was, was brought into the camp in the spring of 1944 to facilitate the arrival of Hungarian Jews. We can see crematoria two, three, four, and five over here. We can see part of the camp that is known as Commando Canada. And here are the first gas chambers, the little red house and the little white house, um, which are the, the very crude preliminary gas chambers before the big ones are built in um, 43. And those come back into usage, at least one of them does in 1944 to help to facilitate the massive arrival of Hungarian Jewry. So that's the place. And the photographs we're gonna see all take place either here on the ramp the ramp that is moved into the camp. Before that, the ramp was about a kilometer away outside of Birkenau and in 1944. Again, in the spring of 44, they start to construct this ramp, this ramp to facilitate the arrival of Jews from Hungary right into the camp, almost to the mouth of the gas chambers. You can see that here. You can see these are the sub camps of, um, of prisoners who are working as slave laborers. Um, and this is where most of the action that we're going to see in these photographs are taken. So we begin with this picture. Remember, what do they want to show us? They want to show us the arrivals of trains and how they're dealt with. These photographs are propaganda photographs. And why do I say that? Again, you create propaganda to give someone an impression, to impress them. And what do they want to show the men back in Berlin? You're sending us train after train after train. Look how quickly and effectively we're getting them into the camp. Look how quickly and effectively we're taking all of their belongings, bringing them so they could be sorted and used and getting them off the train. Now, how do we know that this picture is a propaganda photograph and not a real photo, not an actual photograph? Well, the clue is here. We still have the belongings of this transport. We see the doors are open, which means the people have already been selected and are on the way to the gas chambers. We see the enormous piles of luggage that they've brought with them. And we know that these men have probably been told by their comrades, guys, we're taking photographs, pretend to be opening the doors. Because we know the people on this train would not have been let out while all of this stuff is still on the platform. They don't want them suspicious. They don't want them fighting back. They don't want them. They want them orderly. They want them. They're already so depleted from this terrible train journey that if you get them off the cars and everything looks neat and orderly and there's nothing scary like luggage and, and you know bodies, then you can repeat the process in a neat and orderly way. So these men are taking pictures for their comrades who are standing on top of the train, giving us an overview of the camp. And let's see what they want the men in Berlin to see. Here we have the gas chambers. Here we have the road leading to the gas chambers. And here we have the people getting off the trains. And we can see it's chaotic. People are getting off, they're shouting to each other, they're find, trying to find family members who may have been shoved in another car, they're clutching their belongings. And we see the, um, the men, the uh, Commando Canada, who are supposed to silently wait and facilitate the the. Um, unloading of all of their belongings. We got like an overview of the camp. So for the men in Berlin, they're seeing this is how it works. This is the area where the selection happens. Notice we're not seeing the camp. 
Notice we're not getting a close up of the gas chambers. We want to see how it happens. And we see Jews getting off the trains. And this is something that's also as an amazing that these historians saw this. Because when you look carefully at these trains, you see on the actual trains themselves is the name of the gendarme from, um, from Hungary. And I believe the town is Kosig, and I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but um, excuse me if I'm wrong. We, they were able to trace him and we see the number 71. So we know that 71 human beings were crammed into this tiny cattle car. This is what the Nazis took a picture of. Um, and there they are getting off, which leads us to something very important when we look at these pictures. There's two ways of looking at them. One of them is the way that we see them. These is, this is a condemnation. This is visual proof for anyone who dares to say this didn't happen. Look at it. We see them getting off the train. We see the number of people, 71. We see them with the women and the children. They look disoriented. They're thirsty. They're exhausted. That's what these pictures prove. But for the Nazis, they want to prove something else. They want to prove, look how good we are to the people. Because we will not see anybody with guns trained at them. Notice you don't see snarling, barking dogs. And we know that sometimes people were attacked in do with dogs. Not in these photographs. Again, because they're propaganda photographs for the Nazis. Internal propaganda to show us, look how we can get them off the train. Because we're so clever. We, we made it so no one is suspicious. So we see those two things. These two ways of looking at these pictures in one photograph throughout the whole album. So again, we see the people getting off the trains and everyone, do you notice that people are aware of the presence of the photographers? Photographers are standing above them. And there is a feeling of power here also, that they're above these people taking pictures of them. They have the power, they're in control. We see them, the chaos of the getting off the train. We see the barracks. We see people on the road here and we see the gas chambers and we see that the people here are unaware, completely unaware of what's going on. But we see how they're looking at the photographer. Um, some of them are amused, some little boys. When you show little boys, someone taking a picture of them, children, they're gonna start mugging for the camera. We see that in some of these pictures. The Nazis didn't see that, the photographers didn't see that, but we see their humanity. Um, we also see something incredible. One of the photographers, and we're not sure which one took which pictures. One of them was a little bit more artistic than the other. And one of them had the idea in 1944 to kind of create, um, what are they called? Um, we take a bunch of pictures and put them together, panorama photographs. And we see that very clearly in these pictures. For us seeing them and knowing the fate of these poor people, which by the way, the photographer also knew. He knew these people were going to be murdered. They don't know. But we see them getting into line, getting into order. We see how many children there are. We see that they're thirsty. They have their cups out waiting to get some drinks. And then on the side here, we see a baby partially wrapped up in a shawl being held by a woman. And in the next picture, we see the woman completely. And if you don't look closely at the photographs, you don't notice it that sometimes we're given a second look at these poor people, that they're not frozen forever as one single person, one single photograph, the last and only documentation we have of them. In some of these photographs, we see the same people twice. So let us go back so you can see, there's the baby, there's the shawl, there's the woman holding the baby. Again, why are they taking these photographs? Look, we got them off the train. Now we're getting them into order. Look how the people aren't scared. Look how they're being orderly. Look how we don't have to have guns and dogs and shout at them. Um, we have it so under control. We also noticed something really unusual in these pictures. And I'm sure that we've heard over the years from survivors that upon arrival in Auschwitz, one of the things that people notice right away is the horrible smell. They didn't know what we know, that that is the smell of burning bodies. And in many of the photographs, you'll see people holding their noses because of the smell. And here we see women, some of them looking trustingly at the photographer, 
So he looks very bemused here. He looks exhausted. They finally arrive. Soon they're going to have a chance to settle down, get the kids fed. And this woman is holding her nose from the stench. And the photographer walking among these people. And you must understand, these are people who are very ideologically anti-Semitic. And I'm sure there's a little element of glee, of, of kind of like, boy, do we have them fooled. Look at them. Look how stupid they are. Very, very painful. Um, we have pictures of people waiting in line. By the way, there are personal stories about so many of these pictures. And that would have that would be a whole other uh, presentation to tell you the personal stories, which is what we want to do as guides and what we want to do as Holocaust educators is, is really paramount. But I'm not going to do that in this talk because in this talk, we're going to talk about the photographs themselves and the photographers. So I'm going to save that for another talk. And I won't tell you the story behind Danny here, but we'll save that. But we see the people waiting in line. And now the photographer is back up on top of the train. And again, as we go back to that first picture I showed you, we see what they want them to see in Berlin. Look, they've got all the top guys out here. Yeah, there they are in their uniform, looking very professional. Um, look how they have the people in lines now. Look how orderly it is. And soon they'll be in the process of, you know, of getting rid of these people and, and sending them to the gas chambers and getting their belongings. And he's standing there on the top. And as perpetrator photographs, photographs taken by the perpetrator, the fact that they're on the top shooting photographs of these people below them also has a, an aura of power about it, of control. And we see their colleagues patiently waiting in the photographs for when they begin the selection. And this is something very important, these pictures. The selection happens here. And that's something that's revealed in the photographs because I think for most of us, and what Hollywood always shows us, is one long line of people and the selection happens at the end. We know from examining the photograph, something incredible, the selection happens in the middle and there are two lines facing each other. So what they used to say 30, 40 years ago, left meant one direction and right meant, it depends on the direction you are standing in. So we see the selection happens in the middle. For those of you who have visited Birkenau, it happens right where you cross over um, off the ramp to go into what was the women's camp and this camp over here and for the prisoners who are going to be selected to work they're going to be kept over here sometimes for two hours just waiting and we'll see photographs of that until everyone has been taken to the gas chambers only then will they make their way to the sauna the sauna which is over here where the process of dehumanization of turning them into a prisoner will commence so we're going to continue. And Debbie, I see your hand raised. If you can just hang on to the end because I'm a little wet and I'll lose, um, I'll lose a little, um, I'll lose my train of thought. So hang on to the question and I'll, I'll answer it at the end. Okay, thank you so much, Debbie. Um, so where are we? Okay, here is the proof that there is facing each other from the photographs themselves, from carefully examining the photographs. If you look on the bottom, you'll see women facing this group. And something I did is I look carefully at the pictures and I realized that if you match them up with this group of people standing here, they're the same people from the front and the back. For me, that's something that you could, I don't know, for me, that's a, a moment that you can give them a little bit more life. That you can see them one additional time from the back and try to remember who they were. So we can see as they match them up, their heads, the babies are holding, et cetera. Um, again, in this overview, we see all the goings on. We see how the SS men are in control. We see how the younger people are being sent to that middle area I showed you that is going to be that holding tank, if you will, in between that long walk in between the, the camps to the sauna. We see the collection of all of their belongings. We see a mother and child being sent to the direction of the gas chambers. We see elderly people who have been put on the side. And we see that the SS men, the, the, the camp guards, 
don't have guns trained on these people. In fact, they're using canes. And these canes, they would take off of the elderly people. And we have um, survivor witness, survivor testimony telling us that. And this picture is also particularly fascinating because we see that selection happening from the front. And again, from above, we're not seeing the point of view of the people being selected. We're seeing the point of view of their selection. And what we see here is another train, probably with people on side waiting to get off. That's how we know it was different time periods. One of the reasons we see the gate of Birkenau. And does everyone see this? this um, smoke in the background. The smoke is other trains going along those busy railway lines. Remember, this is a major train hub and trains are going by and trains are on their way to Częstochowy, not Częstochowy, but to um, the border and to other parts of Poland. And we see that po Nazi occupied Poland and to places further south. We see that here on the direction that the, the smoke is going. It's incredible. Another thing, and one of the questions we asked is how do we know there were multiple days? And the answer is in the photographs themselves when you really look at them. So again, we get this top view of the selection process. We have um, the commando um, Canada, the men who were forced to take the belongings. And as we know, sometimes they whisper to people, give the baby to the grandmother, tell them you're 16, et cetera. But we see here something that's also going to be very telling. If you visited Birkenau, there is a drainage ditch here on the side um, that's quite deep. And they were building that ditch in the spring and summer of 1944. In this photograph, we see contracted workers who are digging the ditch. And in this photograph, we see the ditch is not yet dug and the workers aren't there. It's amazing. So different days. That's how historical photographs can help us to understand that this wasn't one transport. Another thing I told you about is, again, the absence of guns. These are propaganda photographs. They don't want to see that they have to use bullets. They want to show in a kind of power, um, proving their power that just through the careful thought that they put into this and the planning and the genius of the commandant that you don't need guns. They've got them fooled. They were fooled when they went onto the trains. So they are holding these canes. We know that this doesn't show that there were uprisings. In May 1942, 44, excuse me, at least twice, groups fought back in front of the gas chambers and they had to shoot everybody. It's in May 40, 44. We don't see that. The Nazis don't want the higher ups to see that. Another thing that's so painful about this picture is we see the little baby and the grandmother being directed to join this long group of people going to gas chambers. We see that cars are coming back and forth, crossing over. And how do we know that this car is moving? First of all, we see the dust is kicking up and we'll see other pictures of trucks moving back and forth and um, guards on bicycles going back and forth. So this is the company, uh, the, the company street. The camp is on either side. It's an active place. And this drama is happening in this very narrow company street. The only instance of violence we see in the photographs is this woman being hit by, with a cane by this SS man. It's the only one. We'll see later on that there was a woman protesting and being dragged by her family, uh, but we see violence only here. Again, they want the men back in Berlin to think they are in total control, that the Jews aren't fighting back because they are so brilliant the way that they've controlled the situation. But by the way, we see here um, from a lower view, but still kind of above these women, um, photographing on the ground of women who have been selected to work and we see the continuation of the selection process. Elie Wiesel writes at night, however, something interesting. And he says, every few yards there stood an SS man, his machine gun trained on us, hand in hand, we followed the throng. An SS came, man came to us wielding a club and he commanded men to the left, women to the right. Now, based on the photographs from these particular four transports, we don't see SS men with their guns out. Does that mean this testimony is incorrect? Absolutely not. 
It's something that we talk about a lot, uh, memory of people who have been through such traumatic um, moments, how memory sometimes is a little, changes a little bit, or they don't quite uh, record exactly what they saw. It could also be that on the day that Elie Wiesel arrived, that the SS men did have their guns out because there had been some attempt at, um, at an uprising or people were not um, controllable. And he remembers the guns being out on that particular day and men to the left, women to the right. Again, it depends on which direction you're coming in. And it's fascinating when you match these testimonies up to what you see. Um, and again, it doesn't mean that he's incorrect in what he sees. We just know that in these particular photographs, guns were not used on the prisoners. They wanted to really present their method in the highest light to the authorities up back home. And we see again the flow, the trucks coming and going. We see these poor people and these pictures are excruciating. And this is not what the Nazis saw. They didn't care that we see women and children and babies on their final march to the gas chambers. They're just showing, look, there they are walking. You could still, the camp could still work. We still have trucks doing their thing. We're still functioning. You don't have to turn the whole camp off. You don't have to stop everything in the camp. We can do this while the camp is still functioning and running. So how do we know where the transport was from? Because in the summer of 1944, there were transports that came from lots of places. Um, so how do we know where this particular transport was from? So first of all, we have the people who signed off or the gendarme that signed off on this particular train. We have his name, he was traced. And there's another very, very um, clear symbols, um, clear indicator where these people are from. By the way, you can get a close up look at that. More, again, I showed you these photographs before, but it's the stars they're wearing. And a very common misconception, I think a lot of us see when we take groups, um, we talk about the Holocaust with groups, is people think that this is like Hollywood and everyone wore a yellow star with the word Yuda on it. And we know that stars varied from countries to countries. And in places like Nazi-occupied Poland, um, in the general government, Jews wore white armbands with blue stars. In France, it's a Juif. Um, in Germany, Austria, and Czech Republic, and Czech, Czech also, uh, the Bohemian Moravia, Yuda, et cetera, et cetera. And we know that because what happened to the Hungarian Jews 56 days. Remember I showed you how quickly Operation Hus is happening. In two weeks, almost 225,000 people are arriving. The people in Hungary made their own stars. They sewed them, their women sewed them, or their men sewed them. Therefore, when we look at photographs, we see these are not printed out stars. They don't say Yuda, they're not armbands, they are homemade. And you can see that they vary from people who had more skills, Two people who really uh, weren't very adept at, at sewing a star. Uh, and that's really the main indicator of where these people were from, besides the fact that the album itself is called The Resettlement of the Jews of Hungary. And again, you can get some ideas of the stars. They can't help themselves with their anti-Semitism and their racial ideology, because even that comes through in the album. The album opens with this picture. Um, and we see two particular photographs showing Yudin Thiepen, Jewish types. The one on the left, we believe, is a staged photograph from a studio trying to show what the Nazis believe were Jewish features. And on the right, as if to confirm, you said this is what Jews look like, here they are, we have um, that um, um, Rabbi Nastali Weiss from Bilki, Hungary, and one of his yeshiva students, or of someone from his shul, who are also photographed as these Jewish types. Uh, and you can see Nazi propaganda themselves showing these Jewish types. And you can imagine the glee of these photographers that they're able to photograph the types themselves in the field. Um, also, the Nazi idea of the um, of already from 19, um, from the, um, what's it called? The, um, the T4 program. Of, of murdering people who are genetically disabled or have some kind of disability or people who have, you know, something that the Nazis considered um, you know, not human. Um, we have this poor individual who's being selected individually to be photographed 
again, you can imagine a photographer kind of gleefully saying, wow, I found uh, someone who, you know, would, would be a, um, a candidate for the T4 program that had been in the 1930s in um, Germany. Uh, again, Rabbi Naftali Weiss, uh, Rosh Hashiva, and Bilke. This is something that's very touching for Hasidic Orthodox people. And um, that we could see their faces, we could see them, you know, their arrival. We can remember who they were. We can see them as individuals when the Nazis couldn't, when the Nazis just saw them as someone to mock and laugh at. Um, lens of poignancy to these photographs that for me is also very, very touching. We could also see how much fun they had in making the Jews suffer even more because Jewish men keep their heads covered. They wear a kippah, they wear a cat hat. And here in their, in their position of control, one of the things they enjoy doing is to force Jewish men to take off their hats. So we have here Orthodox Jewish men with their hats on. And here we see them with the hats off. We also have pictures of Jewish men wearing um, scarves around their beards where their beards were pulled out. And the photographers are gleefully photographing that as well. You can see that these men are distressed. This is very painful for them to be so humiliated. And for the photographer, it's just kind of a, a moment that you can capture that kind of backs up all the ideology you feel and maybe share it with the guys back in the, um, you know, back in the barracks and have a good laugh. This particular photograph is also, I think, very poignant. You see he's holding his hat in his hand. His face says everything. Why are you doing this? Why are you photographing me? What have I done here in my old age to be photographed in this way, to be taken to this place? The photographer is not seeing that. He's just laughing at this poor elderly man who was about to be murdered. We then have that long, horrible walk to the gas chambers. We have how the Nazis see it and we have how we see it. And for those who are getting off the train here, they're forced to walk here. Remember, this is where we saw the crossover. We saw that truck coming this way and we saw people walking in this direction. And they're walking to one of the four um, camp, four um, gas chambers. So we have two, three, four, and five. And this is the sauna over here. And this is where they're going to be walking. And many of the photographs in the Auschwitz album are going to be walking all the way to gas chamber crematoria number four and five. And the photographer is there with them, photographing them telling them, stop, look at me, and taking their pictures. And again, the fact that he is slightly elevated, looking down on them. And there's an element of Nazi ideology here also. Look how, ver look how dirty these people are. Look how many children they have. Look how unkempt they are. Um, this is the enemy. These are the people we're getting rid of for the benefit of humanity. In some of the pictures, again, we have that moment where you get an extra glimpse of the person photographed. And if you don't look carefully at the pictures, you miss them. Again, they're trying to make this panorama where you'll take more than one photograph. So you can make this, I don't know what their plan was, to make a panorama where you have a whole you know, chunk of people walking to the gas chambers. What's always so horrifying to me is look how the kids are looking at the photographer. They're, some of them are excited. It's nice to get your picture taken. But we can see that same woman holding the baby and her children one extra time. And instead of being forever one photograph that nobody, you know, we don't know anything else about her, we get that one additional photograph, um, one extra little memory. I think one of the most uh, poignant photographs that they take inadvertently um, is this grandmother walking with children or mother, and the children have been bundled up because they shouldn't get cold. They have little scarves over their heads. The scarves are tucked in. She's walking with the babies and the toddlers, um, and she took those extra pains to make sure that they would be warm, and the photographer very coldly photographs them. We don't even know what they look like. And again, these pictures are excruciating. You see children without mothers walking by themselves. You see a child who may have been old enough to be selected to work. He's going with the younger children. We don't know much more about these photographs. Again, people looking at the photographers, beautiful young children. And in this particular picture, again, um, 
you can imagine the photographer having a little laugh at their expense because in this picture you see what mothers do if you take pictures of your kids you kind of gather the kids together isn't that nice you can take a picture of them and you can see the mother is smiling and moving the kids closer this one is waving we know that the photographer is walking among the people telling them look at me look at their attitude their bodies are facing in one direction but they're looking at the photographer um why exactly they're doing this to show the flow, I think it's also a little bit not quite um, understandable. I mean, you could back up and show them walking, but there's this extra element of, I know what you don't know, and I'm going to take pictures of you and you know capture forever how, how, how ignorant you were to what your fate was about to be. And this particular photograph, we can see the same picture, people looking at the photographer and the building behind them, which they're completely unaware of, is gas chamber crematory number three. And they're unaware of what that building is and what it's going to, what it symbolizes. And by the way, if any of you had these images of industrial, horrible, scary buildings, notice how the building itself has a nice gabled roof and it, there's fruit trees planted in the front and flowering trees. The building itself also is not scary. All of that proves, look how we fool them. Look how they don't know. Look how they, even when they're almost to the gas chambers, we're so smart and clever, they have no idea what's about to happen to them. And then we have those last excruciating moments before the gas chambers. And we are now here in this area. Uh, gas chamber crematoria four and five, which is in a little woods, a little wooded area, which is still a wooded area of Birkin out today. And we have this testimony from between the two lines formed by SS men that were herded into the nearby grove. And now their fate was finally sealed. For here, within the shadow of the crematoria and its gas chamber, there was no escape. They were standing some 100 meters from the pits, their view blocked by a three meter high camouflage screen. A few SS guards, their rifles at the ready were posted by the screen to prevent anyone getting too close and through the gap stealing a glance at the inferno behind it. So in this testimony, we see how the SS men have planned this so that people wouldn't realize what's about to happen to them and they wanna show it off too. And this pre-programmed suffering was deliberately aimed at paralyzing their ability to notice things and the will to resist in order to allow the giant machinery of mass murder to run smoothly and at full speed. And that's from the account of one of the Hungarian Jews in June 44, talking about how the SS made this happen. And then we have their photographs. And I think in the annals of Holocaust photography, they are some of the most difficult and that's what I showed you at the beginning, because we see women and children who are sitting down on the thirsty, but maybe taking out that last little piece of bread they had saved or the last little chunk of fruit that they had kept care carefully for the last four days, sitting in the grass, giving these things to the children, talking, discussing. We don't know what they're discussing. Maybe they're making plans when we finally get to the barracks. What are we going to do with the kids? I can't wait to put my head down. I can't wait to get the kids clean. We don't know. We can see, however, what the photographer wants us to notice is no one is scared. No one is pleading. No one is begging for their lives. They're sitting, waiting for the next stage, which they think will be a shower and then being taken to barracks for food and for, um, for a place to you know, lie down and rest. And this picture I noticed about 15 years ago working at Yad Vashem, and it's haunted me ever since. I put it on the internet a few years ago, and since then a lot of people have noticed it. When you look carefully at the pictures, you see things like this. And when you go to Birkenau in the summer, and the spring, there are beautiful yellow dandelions. And this part of Birkenau is near a forest, little, little, not forest, little woods. And there's some grass here, which is something very rare in Birkenau because people were so hungry, they ate the grass. But here in this little area for people to wait for their to be murdered, there's still some grass, there were flowers, and we see a child offering a flower to his brother. We also know that the photographer is laughing at these people because in this area, 
there is a pit that has human remains and ashes in it. And because Birkenau is a floodplain, the pit has filled up with water over the over time and it was filled with water even then. And we see a very thirsty man holding a canister going down to that pit. And the pit itself has, oops, let's check the time, has human remains in it. Um, and I'll show you from the map from the Auschwitz Birkenau Museum. It's right around here. And the photographer takes that picture. Now, the only photograph from the album that this shows anyone realizing what's happening is this one elderly woman um, who's probably being led or dragged by her relatives and saying, don't make a fuss. They might shoot us this, and nothing's going to happen. They're probably trying to calm her down um, as she is being led to the gas chamber. It's the only picture in the album where we see someone realizing what's about to happen. Um, and again, to keep them calm, and this is from the, uh, the, 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 the writings of Philip Muller, who was a forced to be a member of the Zonderkommando, the Jews who were forced to burn the bodies of their fellow Jews. This is the speech they would give these people to fool them. And the photographs really fit into that speech because there's almost this element of this glee that look how we're fooling you and look how stupid they are. On behalf of the camp administration, I bid you welcome. This is not a holiday resort, but a labor camp. Now, will you all please get undressed, hang your clothes on the hooks we have provided, and please remember your number. Once we've had your bath, there will be a bowl of soup and tea or coffee for all. And yes, before I forget, after, you, after your bath, please ready have your certificates, diplomas, school reports, and any other documents so that we can employ everyone according to his or her training and ability. With diabetics who are not allowed sugar, report to staff on duty after their baths. So we have testimony of what they said, and we have the photographs to back this up. You wanted to fool these people to the very end. Well, if you remember I said there's different categories in the album, and one of them is very strangely named, Selected for Slate Labor, Still Able-Bodied Men and Women. Uh, we could see here the women, the younger women, who have been selected to be the slaves of the camp. Um, you could see here also the two women holding their noses. Again, that, that smell. What these women probably don't realize at this point is the younger members of their families, the elderly people in their families are already on their way to be gassed. Um, we found in a few of the pictures something incredible. We talk about little acts of resistance. We have a woman sticking her tongue out at the photographer. And we have another woman holding her nose from the smell. We have another what appears to be a woman about to stick her tongue out at the photographer. We see, look at this woman's gaze, how these people are kind of defiantly looking at these men who are taking pictures of them. They must have been a real nuisance. Hey, look at me, take pictures. Of, look at me. Um, again, their bodies were facing forward, but they're being forced to look at the photographer. We see them in the photographs. We see it also in this photograph of the men. Um, you can see by their faces how they feel towards the photographer. They're also worried about the women they've been separated from. And then, if you remember, I said there's a waiting area. While the mass murder is going on, why most of the people are going towards the gas chambers. Remember I showed you in the map that little, that, that long, excuse me, um, in between the camps, that, that area where they are forced to wait till the people are already been gassed and only then can they go to the sauna and go through their dehumanization process. Um, and the photographer takes pictures of that too. And this is another amazing clue. We know now that this photograph is taken on Sunday. And this is what the three researchers found out, the three historians. And how do we know it was Sunday? Because Sunday is the only day in Auschwitz where people had a little bit of time off. And we know it was the only day that they were able to do some kind of laundry if they had you know, the, the ability to do that. So we see laundry. We see people who aren't out working. And we see these young women um, who are really the last moment um, that they still have their hair and have their clothing and have their photographs in their pockets and have their things that they came with. All of that is very soon going to be taken away from them. Um, the same thing with the men. 
We see them standing here. Notice the photographer is raised up again above them. And we see in some of these men almost a military bearing. They're standing there proudly. Look how their shoulders are back. Um, they're 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 trying to, I think, make an impression that they're you know, they're manly, they're strong in the face of, of you know so much power and coercion going on around them. And again, the laundry hanging on the lines. This is very curiously called the lousing, which is the not what's in the album. And why is it curious? Because we don't see the actual delousing process. We don't see them going into the sauna. We don't see their heads being shaved. We don't see that happening. What we do see is the aftermath of women who have had their heads shaved. And because this is 1944, it's late. They don't have these typical striped uniforms or the uniforms they're wearing, old clothing. We have survivor testimonies also. Uh, they're just throwing big piles of clothing into the middle of the sauna and some women are given clothes that don't fit them and there's one woman I forgot her name who was given a ball gown that doesn't fit her so we see these women with their head shaved uh, after having been in the sauna these photographs we don't know they're out of sequence they're not from the same time the historians aren't sure where they're from or why they're even in the album but we see women from another transport we're not sure which one it is what makes it hard for us is we see some of these women are pregnant. And we know what the fate of pregnant women is in Auschwitz. Either the babies are murdered, the babies are taken away for experimentation. And we won't um, address that in this talk, but we. Um, and the last element they want to show is Commando Canada, what they do with the things they brought with them, with the bonanza of all the things these people are bringing with them. And here is Commando Canada and the map of Birkenau. Look how huge it is, it's massive. All of that is filled with the stolen objects of Jewish people arriving. And Rudolf Verba says this, slowly the bags and the clothes and the food and the sad smiling photographs became like people. I mean, he's forced to work by the way, as a um, Commando Canada before he's able to escape. Um, the prams became babies and the heaps of carefully segregated little shoes became children like my cousin Litsi and Topol Kani, the pronunciation. And careful observation of these pictures also shows us two gut-wrenching things. We see um, what they brought with them, the baskets and the pots and the clothing and everything wrapped up in their blankets. And we see these aren't wealthy Jewish people. The fact that they wrap up their stuff in a sheet and tie a knot in the sheet or took a suitcase out of straw uh, would be very different than some of the Jews who came from Western Europe who did have um, more means. Um, we also see uh, in a few cases that some of them have suitcases um, and we see suitcases on display at Auschwitz Birkenau State Museum. We now know when the photographs were taken, if they were taken before they were gassed, in other words, on the ramp, and if they were taken after they were gassed. And how do we know that? Because in these photographs, we have clothing arriving. And the reason the clothing is not in suitcases is this is the clothing that was gathered after they were gassed. When we were forced to undress in the undressing rooms and hang their clothing up, the clothing is taken, taken to Commando Canada, we see a woman um, guard, a woman capo. Women work inside the barracks dealing with the clothing. The men brought the clothing to them. So we see that it is arriving, we see her. And you can make a comparison. Here we have the suitcases and the bundles that they left on the ramp, which we saw in the pictures before. And then we see clothing and the things they took off when they were gassed. Another picture here that's very touching is we see a wheelchair. And in one of the pictures here, we see an elderly man sitting in a wheelchair. They had transports just of wheelchairs and baby carriages and baby buggies. Um, the trains would come in loaded with the Jewish victims and they would go out loaded with their belongings to be taken back and used um, in Germany. And then we have this last picture of the pile of shoes um, these women are dealing with um, this, this an idea of the amount of people arriving every day.
So, uh, and Reska Weiss, right, we found ourselves near a building to the right of which was a large mound about the size of a two-story building. As we neared the mound, we saw it was made entirely of shoes. So that's why the album was taken. What don't we see in the album? We don't see the gassing process. We don't see close-ups of the SS. We don't see where the people lived. And we don't see the beginning of the process. We don't see those people being rounded up, taken from their homes, um, taken to temporary ghettos, and from there being sent to be murdered. We don't see any of that. I just want to show you these pictures from Kusheg, June 18th, 1944, which is when um, the, these people are arriving. And I believe that one of the transports in the photographs is from here. We see them walking through the town. We see the Hungarian gendarme taking them. We see them getting piled into the cattle car. And what we also don't see is who they were as human beings, who they were before the war, who they, what their faces were like, what their hopes and ambitions were, what the Nazis give us is just people in the last moments, both of them, um, of their lives. And I think it's our duty um, as we remember them to remember and to teach that these were people, everyone was a universe, everyone had a face, everyone had hopes and ambitions and talent, and everything that makes us human. And that album we just saw tried to take that humanity away. And I think something we have to do every day is to remember and celebrate their humanity. So thank you very much, everybody. I'll stop sharing. I'm sorry I couldn't answer the... Uh, yes, uh, Mina, they were from um, Transcarpathia, Rus is the area. Great. Um, so I see some of your questions here because I'm kind of hard to answer questions also. Um, so if anyone wants to ask me a question, ask away. Liz, I'd like to thank you on behalf of everybody here today so, so much for your beautiful presentation. It's the third oh, time you. I've had the honor to watch it over many years. And it's I've learned something new every, every time. Oh, thank um, you. So thank you so much for helping us. I know you mentioned uh, during one slide that it were that things were set up uh, for the arrivals of these uh, victims that they didn't notice. And I think you've really done, it really struck me because you've done this incredible job of making us notice and helping us notice. Um, and thank you for doing that. And having that last slide up there where you remind us of the victims before they became victims, because victimhood is never a choice. Um, and having the background of those photographs, a colorful tablecloth, reminds us that these are people who live their life in color they weren't living their life in black and white and we we see these black and white photos and it seems so distant to us but these are people who are some of them are survivors who are still alive today so thank you for for bringing us um that awareness so there's lots of thank yous coming up in the chat um in the meantime we have a few questions if you, you do have time to Wonderful. answer them and i also want to say i'm so glad that that people are bringing their own knowledge and saying, oh, this is, you know, this. And because when you understand the history behind the photographs, you can make them come alive. And everyone is adding things. And that's Thank so you, important. everyone, who's added so much so far of your own knowledge. So Bob has a question. A number of photos show full faces of uniformed guards. Has any effort been made to enhance the photos to identify the perpetrators? Um, yes. And I know that there was a whole documentary about them that on some of the photographs is a man called Hooker um, who was identified using modern technology also by his the size of his body and his shoulders. And yes, one thing the photographs show us is that often survivors said that every single um, transport was, it was Dr. Mengele who did the, um, the selection. And we can see that, um, yes, he was present at some of these selections, but not every one. And again, um, in, in so much memory survivors have, we can never really say, well, you don't remember exactly, so it's not true. Um, think about our own memories that we have of events that I can't even remember what I ate for lunch today. Um, but it does prove that some of these men, you know, were just, you know, that was their, they were the duty guy on, on duty that day doing the evening. So if there's an excellent documentary that came out um, about 10 years ago, more than that, when they discovered the second Auschwitz album, which is the guards 
and the camp staff in, in Sola Huta, a uh, little relaxation place about 20 or 30 kilometers away from Auschwitz, uh, eating berries and playing on the accordion. And we recognized some of the guards from those pictures. And there's an excellent documentary that came out that also talks about Hooker, the man who was mm -hmm. on duty the day that a lot of these pictures were taken. Absolutely. And that album, the Hooker album, which is also part of the Seeing Auschwitz exhibition that we currently have on display, um, it's very confrontational because the gods in the picture are depicted at rest, at ease. They're playing the accordion. They're eating blueberries. They, right, have they don't have enough blueberries. There's yeah, they have their children blueberries. with them. And um, they, they are, of course, or were once ordinary men, uh, people who made choices. And um, a lot of them have been identified and before the war had very average professions, very ordinary professions. One was a confectioner. One was a gardener. One was an accountant. And... Yeah and they've ended up there. Um, another question from um, another participant, Amy, has there been an attempt to utilize AI in hopes of matching with images of Hungarians that remain prior to the war? I'm looking for the, Mo I'm looking for the Moses family, including twins Eva and Maria Moses, who were taken by Mengele. The, these are uh, Eva Moses' core, as you probably most of you right. know, was a very, very right. well-known famous survivor who sadly passed away yeah. in the past years. Um, and her and her sister are pictured in some of the liberation photographs, those very infamous pictures of the children being liberated and photographed also propaganda photographs behind the barbed wire. But even Moses Core went on and became a very, very vocal survivor. The candles museum, the candles, right. From what I know, and so as you imagine, this is only four transports. Do you remember I said at the beginning, 225,000 people arrived in Operation Huss. From what I know, and they're not in these particular photographs. You could have eight transports in a day, one after the other after that. We see that in the photographs. Um, but I do know that um, historians are using um, AI. It's really fascinating. It's a whole other subject to identify people as they did with Hucker by his shape and by measurements. It's all kinds of really fascinating ways. It also presents another very difficult dilemma that we're going to be facing in the future. And that is if AI can help identify people, AI can also alter photographs. It can make the perpetrators not the Nazis. It can stick other people in there. It can change the way that we remember history, which is also very worrisome. As wonderful a tool as it is, that's another whole discussion in itself. But yes, historians are are, are realizing that, that you can begin to um, really research a lot more using the technology that's available today. Thank you for that. Amy actually has now mentioned in the chat that she worked with Eva and was very close to her. So that's really remarkable. I met her um, once at the Shem, Eva, um, Amy. She was a lovely woman. Someone else also mentioned in the chat that uh, they observed that the people in the photographs are wearing heavy coats and all their, all their clothes, um, but it's not winter. That's right. Um, it's not winter. And there could be a few reasons for that. We know that when people are allowed to bring only a certain amount of clothing, sometimes they pile the clothing up. Um, anyone who's been to uh, Poland, which was then Nazi occupied Poland, knows that April, May, June can sometimes be a little cold um, in Central Europe. And um, again, we think that that's probably also because they were taking their clothing. These are very poor people. Most of the people who were sent here from this part of, of Hungary were impoverished people. Some of them lived in villages with no toilets, with no running water, with no electricity. Um, you can see that from the poverty. They had no idea what was about to happen to them. They, they were allowed to take 50 kilos or wherever much they were allowed, put the clothing on the children, keep the children warm, wear three jackets, wear three socks, wear... Um, and we see that in some of the pictures as well. Yeah, so much so that there's a very uh, well-known image that uh, Liz, you shared of um, one of the photos after the selection process when there are a selection of men who are left on the platform and a smaller group of women. And, uh, oh, sorry, I, I apologize. It's actually before the selection. And one of the, the females standing right in front of the, of the group is dressed in heavy clothes with a scarf around her, her head. Uh, she looks about middle aged, maybe even older, and it turns out that she is Irene Weiss, a survivor who is still alive today, 
um, whose wow. daughter Leslie uh, works in Washington in Holocaust education, but also visited our museum and pointed it out to us. And she asked me, how old do you think this person is? I said, you know, maybe in her 50s, 60s. And it turns out she was about 14. Mm-hmm. Um, and she is and she is saved for, for labor. Amazing. So if anyone That's else does one have... thing, let's remember that yes. most of these women are very orthodox. Uh, this is a very orthodox air part of Hungary, and many of them are wearing the traditional head coverings because that's what Orthodox Jewish women do. Mm-hmm. So it's less for you know warmth and protection; it's more for for modesty, for for Jewish yeah. modesty. and the men as well. Likewise, mm-hmm. um, if anyone does have any other questions, please feel free to add them now because we'll be wrapping up shortly. Um, I think I think that point that you make, Liz, about people's uh, people's fashion, people the, the the clothes that were worn at the time, mm-hmm. is also sometimes a barrier for us feeling like we can relate or identify to the victims because they look different to how we dress now. Sometimes they don't smile in family photographs. But I think that using primary sources like you have in this presentation really does help students that come to our museums or visitors um, to really bring this history to life, so to speak, um, and to make people realize that this history happened to real people who, as you mentioned, very beautifully and poignantly, each had hopes and dreams that the Nazis did not recognize and did not think were worthy of being carried out. So um, as we finish, there's someone who's requested uh, whether they could have your email address or any further information. Please, anything Sam may ask. I'm happy to do the best I can. Um, again, I'm not a, uh, a deep Holocaust scholar, a deep researcher. These are This is incredible research that was done by three astonishing scholars who spent more than three years researching and matching it with German records. And it's just, for me, it's incredible, but I am a visual artist. Um, and to really get into those pictures that, are, that have been so much a part of my life, um, this is it's, it's amazing. Absolutely. It's, it's amazing to hear what that experience must have been like to uh, work with these images every day and start recognizing the faces in, in the pictures who some of have been identified today, including Lily Jacobs, her brothers and her grandparents are all in that album. Um, so someone has asked whether you could share your email address or we'll share it in the group. Uh, in the group chat if if that's okay um and would you maybe uh finish uh by maybe sharing any additional resources or recommendations you have if people are interested in the topic and maybe about the fact that the album is at Yad Vashem yes the album is at Yad Vashem um I know that we have a wonderful website up about I know that they're also um the website is going to be the history is going to be updated soon I think most um Institutes are going to be updating their history in light of this new research. I could also send you the names of these uh, wonderful historians. Um, you can find some of their uh, work online even, um, read essays they've written, um, the books they've written. Um, and again, I chose today not to tell the stories of the individuals, which is also, that's that one story you told about the woman, how old was I? She was actually 14. This, this makes it so impactful. Um, I chose to talk about the, why they did it. Um, and again, I see from your comments, there's so much to talk about and there's so much to teach from these images. And one more important thing for teachers is notice there's no violent images. There's no images of bodies. There's nothing that's, too difficult for younger students to see, but it's, it's an incredible teaching tool as well. So I will be happy to send you a little list of resources for anyone who'd like to get more information and um, use it. And uh, yeah, we'd like to thank you and Yad Vashem, of course, for providing such in-depth information and for being the preservers of this memory, uh, literally in, in terms of your archive. And I'll just finish by maybe reading one of the comments who said, Liz, you're astounding, such depth of knowledge, such sensitivity, such a lover of humanity. And Paula, who said, thank you so much, your passion and knowledge shine in your presentation. So I think we all echo this, those sentiments and we feel very lucky to have had you join us tonight. From well, it was really my honor. So thank you so much. And everyone thank have you, a everybody. Thank you Bye so much. Everyone. Bye. Thanks. Good night, everyone.